Uh, so Sarah, uh, some of you know, is a reporter from um, Bloomberg. She spent about um, more than five years at, with Reuters before that. Um, I think sort of cut her teeth at uh, the Wall Street Journal working for its LA and Hong Kong bureaus. And today she is going to be interviewing, oh hi, <laughs> um, Daphne Kohler, who is amazing, um, who I'm sure many of you already know this, but uh, Daphne has many, many, many credits to her name, but um, she is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford, where she helped uh, sort of establish the artificial intelligence discipline there. Um, a MacArthur, MacArthur Fellowship recipient, co-founder of the online education company Coursera, which I think just raised a series C, or E, excuse me, um, and more recently co-founded um, and is the CEO of a drug development company called Incitro, which quietly raised $100 million in series A funding, I think last month or the month before, and we're gonna learn about what's so interesting here. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Connie. Daphne, thank you so much for coming to talk to us tonight. So thank you, Sarah. Tell us, what is Incitro exactly? Incitro is uh, trying to rethink the drug development process from the ground up by thinking about data and machine learning as foundational assets that help address key bottlenecks in the drug development process so that we can make drugs um, faster, better, and cheaper. Great. So. Why, why is this such a good time to be working in that area now? I think we, uh, when I started working in the area of machine learning applied to biomedical data sets, that was a while ago, that was around 2000. And at that point, a large data set in biology was a couple hundred samples if you were very, very lucky. And we're now at a moment in history where there is a confluence of technologies that have all emerged at about the same time that allow really large and interesting and disease relevant data sets to be produced in biology and at the same time, in parallel, we see that um, on the machine learning side, there's now technologies that are able to make sense of that data and really come up with novel insights that can hopefully help cure disease. So on top of the 100 million in funding, which came from Andreessen Horowitz and GV and Arch and a bunch of top tier backers, yes. you just announced a deal with Gilead, right? Yes. Okay. So. Talk to us a little bit about that. Did you say that had the potential to reach a billion dollars? Yes. That's a lot of money. <laughs> it is a lot of money. So what Although, do you have to do to get there? <laughs> well, so the money has uh, two parts to it. There is 50 million on top of the 100 million that we've already raised that is in short-term capital to help us build the platform and really come up with novel targets that will help uh, with the disease of NASH, which is a, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that is likely to become the most common form of liver cancer and liver transplant in the coming decade. Um, and then on top of that, there is the potential for up to five programs that would each, if, if successful, lead to a therapy, and each of those has $200 million in milestones that would come with it. And is that all for fatty liver or different? Yes. Oh, wow. This is all for fatty liver. Okay. And so why that particular disease? So there's a fairly broad category of diseases that um, our technology is well suited for. We're really interested in um, creating um, in what you might call disease in a dish models, places where diseases that are really complex, where we haven't really had a good model system, where the typical animal models that have been used just aren't very effective, um, and creating models of those in an in vitro, what's called in an in dish model, so that we can then use that model when to generate very large amounts of data that can be interpreted in mach using machine learning. There's a whole slew of diseases that lend themselves to this type of approach. NASH was one of them. And so partly it was the suitability of our technology to this disease, and partly it was the fact that Gilead just was a really good partner for that because they have a whole bunch of human data from some of the clinical trials that they've been running. So we actually have access to two complementary data sources. One is what happens to the disease in large human cohorts, and one is what happens when you look at what the disease does in vitro in, in, the, in the dish, and then see if we can use the, what we see in the dish using machine learning to predict what we see in the human, and that's what makes it a good model system. Okay, and I think one of the things you've said is that normally pharma companies look at data as a byproduct. Yes. Okay, and you look at data as the primary, the foundation of your company, right? 
Yes, it's, it's actually quite interesting because you go to a pharma company and they say, oh, we have lots of data. And you ask them, what kind of data do you have? And it turns out they have dribs and drabs of data, each stored on a separate spreadsheet in someone else's laptop. They don't even know, in many cases, what data they have. And there's uh, metadata that isn't even recorded. So for them, it's kind of like, yeah, I did the experiment and obviously I recorded what I had to because it doesn't make sense to throw it away, but they don't think of it as something that you build a company on top of. And we come at it a completely different way. We say, this is the problem that you'd like to solve. If we only had a model that could tell us the result of this experiment without having to do the experiment because it's expensive or complicated, then that would be transformative. Well, machine learning has gotten really good at building predictive models if you give it the right data to train the model. And so we are in the business of actually building data for the sole purpose of training machine learning models. This is not data that would ever be generated for any other purpose, the only purpose for which the data is generated is to train machine learning models, or what we think of as little crystal balls that would allow you to um, avoid doing experiments that are complex or even impossible. Like, you cannot do the experiment of, if I were to perturb this particular gene in Sarah, what would that do to Sarah? You don't get to do that experiment, but you can do that, uh, you can maybe make that prediction using a machine learning model. Okay. And then I think I've heard you talk, um, I think at Jeff Bezos' conference, and he's in it through Bezos Expeditions, yes. is an investor as well. Yes. You talked about something called the All of Us Project, and yes. it sounds like you're expecting to get data from that that mm -hmm. will really inform your company. So can you tell us a little bit sure. about that project and what it is? So in fact, that project, um, I would say the US, if anything, is a little bit late to the game on this one. There's been a number of national cohorts that have been generated in different countries. The one that's currently, I think, uh, the two that are currently best developed is um, there's one in Iceland, and there's one in the UK, but there's also one in Finland, and one in Ireland, and even in Estonia, where they've taken a large population from within that country measured their genetics, but also measured a whole lot of properties about each of those people, uh, blood biomarkers and urine biomarkers and behavioral aspects and physical aspects and imaging. And so what you have now is a data set that tells you experiments of nature. Nature perturbed this gene, and we see this effect on the human. And so in some sense, those data sets are remarkably valuable for exactly the purpose that we talked about, which is if I perturb this gene in Sarah, what is it going to do to various properties, um, whether it's disease properties or height or even educational attainment? The idea being that in the future, you could perturb genes in a human and help disease, or just it would help with drug development? So you could certainly think of um, therapies that perturb genes directly, but any drug that we put in a human basically has targets that perturb the function of specific genes. So any drug really perturbs the gene, not by modifying the actual genome, but by modulating the function of those genes. So this is valuable not just for gene therapies, or not even primarily for gene therapies, but just as a way of identifying targets that actually make a difference difference, because most drugs that go into clinical trials fail, and by most I mean 95%. So it's not that 95% succeed and 5% fail, it's the other way around. And most drugs fail because they are targeting the wrong thing. They are targeting proteins or genes that just do not affect the disease that they're supposed to affect. The recent very visible failure of the um, Alzheimer's drug trials, it's actually several of them in a row, are almost certainly because the protein that they were targeting called amyloid beta is just not the right causal factor in the disease. So this project, are these government-run projects? Like here, will it be an NIH uh, project? Okay. All of Us is an NIH product, project. The UK Biobank is um, supported by a comparable body in the UK okay. and similarly in other countries. Okay. And you said in the UK the questions got really specific, like Very specific. are you eating samosas? How many of them are you <laughs> okay. eating per week? <laughs> and how does that possibly help inform drug discovery? <laughs> well, you know, honestly, we don't know, and it would not have been at the top of my list of questions to ask, but um, they wrote down questionnaires 
there's every one of those 500,000 volunteers basically went for a full two-day testing. And yeah, this is probably not the most interesting question that was asked, but they did cognitive testing and physical tests, and they measured blood pressure and you know immune phenotypes in the blood and urine biomarkers and, and images of the brain and images of the abdomen. It's an incredibly rich data set that is, I mean, discoveries from that are coming along on a pre pretty much a weekly basis. Wow, okay, so when you say we're late here, have they started oh, recruiting yeah. the people here, or not quite yet? They have started recruiting, I think, in the last couple of months. They recruited their first cohort. The yeah. UK Biobank has been operational for about five years, oh. and again, because they have a single-payer healthcare system, the, as they also do in Finland and elsewhere, the uh, individuals that volunteered for this also have agreed to have a tie-in to, um, to their medical records, so they have longitudinal follow-up. So even if people didn't have, say, Alzheimer's or type 2 diabetes at the time that they were recruited, you know that they ended up developing it, so you kind of have a prospective trial to say, what is it about these people that may have caused them to develop the disease, whereas people with what seemed to be similar genetic composition didn't develop the disease. And so you can really start to think about teasing out the factors in a way that um, sort of tries to decouple some of the aspects of causality. Okay. And then um, also you were saying it's not just all the data we have now, right? It's the tools that are available, and you were talking about things we can do with stem cells now yeah. that wouldn't have been popular, yes. uh, possible even a few years ago. So those are some of the tools that have really enabled the creation of not only large amounts of data, but large amounts of biologically relevant data. So um, you, we used to do experiments in cellular systems on cancer cell lines. Some of you might have read the Henrietta Lacks book and the fact that cancer cells from her were taken 50 plus years ago and have been effectively used for the last 50 plus years. And by this point, cells that have been sort of in the lab growing in a dish for 50 years honestly resemble very little of human biology. Some of them have eight copies of a chromosome rather than two. So it's really not a very disease relevant model. Today we're able to go to any single one of you and take a small sample of skin cells and use what's called the Amanaka factors, which have been a, shown as a way which, for which they, he won the Nobel Prize, to reprogram those cells to stem cell status, which is the cells that exist um, effectively at, 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 in the womb. And then those cells are capable, they're pluripotent, they're capable of differentiating themselves into neural cells or liver cells or cardiac cells. And those are very disease relevant because they represent human biology. And so you can take those cells now from patients, you can take them from healthy people, and see if there's differences in how they appear. So one of my favorite papers in this regard, although there are many, is a paper that was recently written by one of the folks in, uh, at Incitro, uh, along with others at uh, Memorial, at Mass General in, in, um, in uh, Cambridge, um, where you take some, skin cells from schizophrenia patients and skin cells from healthy controls. You bring them back to stem cell status. You create neurons. And what happens is that the neurons on the, um, on the schizophrenia patients have fewer synapses because immune cells gobble them up. Um, whereas the skin cell, whereas the, the neurons that you get from healthy controls don't have that. And so you can see a distinctive difference in the cellular system between sick patients and healthy patients. And now you can ask yourself, well, if we see that, can we now intervene in the system and revert the disease phenotype to a healthy state? And if we do, maybe that's a starting point for treatment for schizophrenia that would avoid that eating up of the synapses. And by the way, I will say that that gobbling up of the synapses has been observed in post-mortem brain samples of schizophrenia patients. So it's consistent with what we see in the human data. And so for us, that's why you asked why Gilead, why Nash? The availability of human disease progression data is an important validation to ensure that what we see in the dish actually corresponds to human biology. Okay, I don't mean to get too technical, but synapses are how cells talk to each other, exactly. right? So why would a schizophrenic person have fewer? Like, why would that contribute to schizophrenia? Wouldn't they have more? Honestly, we don't know. I don't think that the causal, the causal pathways that, um, that 
start with synaptic deficit and correspond and then lead to psychotic episodes. No one understands that. The brain is really, really complicated. But the point is, and in some sense, the premise of what we're doing as a company is that you don't need to understand the why in order to believe that an intervention might be beneficial. And in I fact, most drugs, we do not understand why they work. But this gives us a platform that we can use to potentially identify interventions that might work. And honestly, we then put them into people in a randomized clinical trial, assuming that safety has been taken care of, which of course is there's a whole protocol mm -hmm. for that. And then we can see if it works, but it gives you confidence that it might work. Sure, that's a little bit humbling to yeah. just not understand why, but see that it works anyway and just go there. In biology, much of our understanding is an illusion. There's things that we thought we understood five years ago and now realize are completely wrong. And so uh, our ability, I mean, five years ago, people didn't think you could actually generate stem cells from, um, from fully differentiated cells, or maybe not five years, but 10 years. And so I think it's just uh, the ability to observe biology in a dish and use that to then extrapolate to what we might see in a human, I think is just an amazing That's capability. Incredible. And over time, in 15 years, maybe we'll understand more. But what I want to do now is cure people and then leave people to understand, leave scientists to figure out why this works. Got it. After my next question, I'm going to see if anybody in the audience has something to ask Daphne. But a lot of people get interested in medicine because of some personal experience, like we were just talking about Mary Lou Jepsen and her yeah. company, she had brain cancer and became, you know, went from robotics to her kind of next generation yeah. version of an MRI. Did you have any kind of personal experience that made you really want to get involved in um, disease cure discovery? So I think originally this was um, partly for me just a really interesting intellectual mm -hmm. exercise. I was looking for cool data sets for machine learning um, that are more interesting than than sort of the vanilla ones that a lot of uh, that were the norm in the field back then. But yeah, then a couple of sort of things happened. Um, that I think shifted that. First of all, my father died from a very nasty autoimmune disease that no one could even diagnose, far less begin to cure. Um, and then a number of us in our family, including myself, are, are cancer survivors. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that you survived, and um, that's inspiring. Um, does anybody in the audience have a question for Daphne? Yeah. that with the questioning of the kind of the data sets that are being gathered how is the focus in terms of um you know, drug generation intervention via drugs and kind of partnering with companies like gilead to kind of push that through is on its own kind of a lucrative way to go about it but you know the, the less lucrative route is the more homeopathic kind of things interventions that maybe take a longer time and more data gathering over a lifetime to then kind of come to a conclusion is you know, there's like you said there's a prevalence of autoimmune diseases like you know especially in the US like I feel like everywhere I turn a friend has an autoimmune disease mm -hmm. um, and kind of that those factors that are a little harder to capture um, and then the interventions a little less defined in the sense that there's no drug and like that's actually going to match what you found how is that I, I don't know if one can say that for these diseases there's no drug. Um, one can sometimes say there's no drug today, but that doesn't mean that there's no drug tomorrow. And one of the things that we are now starting to see is this miraculous um, ability to treat uh, diseases that have up until now been viewed as untreatable. Um, probably the a poster child for that is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis used to be a death sentence. Uh, the Human Genome Project allowed us as a community to identify the cystic fibrosis gene and, in fact, specific genetic changes to that gene that cause cystic fibrosis and specific changes that are 
different. And what um, Vertex Therapeutics has done, which I think is just nothing short of a miracle for cystic fibrosis patients, is that for people who have this particular letter change in their DNA, this is the drug that's going to make them better. And another group of patients has a different letter in the same gene, um, not that far away, and that's a different drug. And what we see is that that very personalized therapeutic intervention is now letting 90% of cystic fibrosis patients live an effectively normal life. Um, and so I think over time, we're starting to identify new types of insights about disease and new types of therapeutic interventions that, um, I'll give you another example, um, spinal muscular atrophy was a death sentence for kids, kill them usually before the age of two. And um, by introducing an, a completely different, not a small molecule, not an antibody, a completely different therapeutic modality called an antisense oligo, the, they're able to sort of change how the protein works within that within those cells. And again, those kids now have, many of them have an almost normal life. So I think there's a range of modalities, a range of interventions that we can come up with. And, and, and those have really transformed our ability to deliver therapeutic interventions. And what is oftentimes missing is which of the many genes that contribute to a disease are the ones that are going to be the most uh, significant as an intervention point, and that's effectively the problem that we're trying to solve. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, in the back there. Well, I think that scientific understanding in many cases is a, is a two-edged sword. Um, and in the same way that nuclear, uh, you know, you have nuclear bombs and you have nuclear uh, uh, reactors that create energy. Uh, I don't think understanding on its own is harmful and certainly understanding the gene that causes um, cystic fibrosis, that can only be to the betterment of humanity. If you want to prevent gene editing, I think that has to be on the delivery side of this and honestly just on the social aspects of what's permissible and what's not and just creating a sort of set of norms on what is permissible and what's not. Stopping scientific understanding is not the answer. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, you. Okay, so that's not a two-part question, that's two questions, but um, <laughs> chronic fatigue syndrome has recently been understood to be a, um, an autoimmune disease. Um, there are many autoimmune diseases that are not yet sufficiently well understood to have a treatment, but I think with some of the newer tools that have emerged, um, including some of the ones that we employ, but also others, there is the glimmerings of an opportunity to understand what is the antigen that's being presented that's causing the immune system to react against self, against the cells of the body. And once you have that understanding, there is a much greater opportunity to have the right targeted intervention for those patients. So unfortunately, this is a long process process because uh, developing drugs is a long time. It takes a long time because of all the safety issues of what you need to go through before you put a drug in a human, as, as one should be careful about that. But I think there is, the, the, the edge of the thread is there, and I think there is people who are now starting to follow that. Um, as it relates to the question of clinical trials, I actually don't know that um, 
convincing people to participate in clinical trials is the major obstacle. I think that there is a huge disparity in access right now because of the fact that um, mostly the people who have access to clinical trials are the ones that are in the vicinity of large academic centers, be it Memorial Sloan Kettering or, or Stanford or whatever, Dana-Farber. Um, the people who live in other parts of the country, the rural areas that are further away from those centers, or even more so in other parts of the world where you're even further away from a large academic center, very rarely have access to clinical trials. Where I think there is a huge opportunity, and I know some companies are leveraging that, is in uh, allowing uh, what you might think of as virtual or distributed clinical trials, where people are largely able to benefit from a clinical trial from within their own home, and their symptoms and such are recorded via mobile devices or wearables and so on and so forth and are being transmitted to the uh, primary care centers so that they're only needing to go there personally months, uh, on a much less frequent basis. And that, I think, will open much greater opportunities for people who are very sick and can't make that trip uh, on a regular basis, um, give them access to clinical trial opportunities. Daphne, I know you're working on fatty liver with um, Gilead yeah. now. But what other diseases would you like to, like what would be the next step after that or concurrent with that? So I think we've done a fair bit of exercise internally in thinking about what makes a disease one that is well targeted by the kinds of approaches that we're developing. So first of all, you know, for instance, given the fact that we're using these um, cellular systems, you need to be able to create the right cell systems, and some cell systems are much easier to create than others. It turns out, for whatever reasons, cells like to become neurons much more than they like to become bone cells. So it's a lot easier, in some sense, to deal with neuronal diseases in these in vitro systems. Um, it, cell diseases that have a strong genetic basis, because if it's an entirely random, sporadic disease, like injury or what you might get by smoking three packs a day, it's kind of hard to get a cell to smoke three packs a day. Um, so there's characteristics like that. But then the other one that I think is just really important is the lack of other model systems that allow you to really explore the therapeutic space. So the current standard for drug development is animal models. Um, and it turns out that animal models are reasonably good for a small set of diseases. Infectious diseases come to mind as a place where they've actually been a pretty good place to develop drugs. Most of the diseases that are really stumping us today, um, metabolic diseases, mouse metabolism is very, very different to a human. Um, my, mice don't get type 2 diabetes. They certainly don't get atherosclerosis. But even more so, if you think about CNS diseases, um, diseases of the central nervous system, be it neurodegeneration or neuropsychiatric diseases, mice do not get schizophrenia. They just don't. They also do not get depressed. Um, they don't have bipolar disorder. They don't get Alzheimer's disease. So all of the mouse models that we have for these diseases range from bad to really, really bad. Um, and so I think that's one of the limiting factors that's prevented us from really developing beneficial therapeutics for those diseases is that we haven't had a model system to try stuff out because trying stuff out in the human is the last step of the process. So we're really thinking about where have these models failed us and therefore where are the big opportunities to really make a difference. So any one of those that you might hone in on, you mentioned CNS, type 2 diabetes, or are these all things that you're considering equally at this point? Or? Uh, well, there's stuff that we're considering, but we're not talking about oh, yet. Okay. <laughs> all right, Daphne, thank you so much. Thank you.